Okay, so last time we were taught, we started talking about differential equations, which is our third big section of the class. Um, and what I did last time is I uh, I showed you some examples of some various differential equations. And so just to remind you, a differential equation is just, so in a differential equation, we have an unknown function. described in terms of its derivatives. So, I mean, a, a really almost um, so, so usually this is written the function is called y, but it doesn't have to be, sometimes it's x, and so on. And, and in some sense, some of the integration pro problems that we did are really kind of differential equations, like when I write the integral of x dx is sub y, well, this is the same as saying that the derivative of y is x. Right? We're looking for a function whose derivative is x. So this is a very easy differential equation. We can easily see that, so that means that y, well from here, we know that y is x squared over 2 plus a constant. Um, but of course we can have more complicated things well, we can't just integrate one side or the other. We have to work harder to find the formula. And a lot of differential equations, just like a lot of integrals, you can't write down the formula directly. So just as in a number of integrals that we saw, like the integral of, I don't know, sine x over x, there is no formula for that function. Similarly here, there's no, here there's a nice formula, we can write down differential equations for which there's no nice formula. That doesn't mean the equation doesn't have a solution. It just means we can't describe it in a nice way. Um, but we can still understand it even if we can't write down a formula. Okay? So even, even if we can't write a formula, you can still understand what's going on. So one of the examples that we looked at last time towards the end was this differential equation where the derivative of some function p, oh, let me point out one thing. One thing that we often do here is we suppress the fact that this is a function. Right? In some sense, I should really be saying f prime of x equals x. And that makes it clearer that it's a function. But usually, you just call it y, and you say the derivative of y is x, and it's implied that y is a function of x, okay, or of t, or whatever it is. And there may not even appear an x in the, fun in the equation. So for example here, if we write that the derivative of p is some constant times p, times 1 minus p, and here it should be implied that p is a function of some known unknown variable, which we can call t or we can call x, it's our choice. Here p is standing for population, so we would probably use the variable t as the dependent as the independent variable, and p is the dependent variable, but whatever. Now when we write an equation like this, you can still sort of understand 
without being able to solve it, maybe you can solve it. We'll solve this one later because it is a nice formula that tells us what it is. You can still sort of understand how the solutions are going to behave just by looking at the equation. So for example, if we know that p of t is 0 at some, let's, some t, some t, uh, let's just say at t equals 0. So let's, let's just pick 0. If I know that the time is 0 and p of 0 is 0, so I don't need the at sum anymore. What do I know about p? follows this equation. Given that the population in 2005 was zero, what's the population now? Zero. Because why? Because the derivative is 2 times p times 1 minus p and the derivative at 2009, 2005, was 2 times 0 times 1. Which is 0. So that means that, the, that means, so this tells us that p of t is a constant. Because the only functions whose derivatives are 0 are constant functions. So it was a constant at 2005, so the population in 2006 is the same as in 2005 because it was a constant. And it's always the same. And it was zero once, so it's always zero. So this is called, well, and then let's, let's take another example. Same example, but another choice. If the population in 2005 was 1. This is measured in, I don't know, millions. So the population in 2005 was 1. What's the population in 2009? 1. Because P prime in 2005 is 2 times P in 2005, which is a number we don't know, times 1 minus P in 2005. But I said this was 1. Oh, yeah, this is 1. So this is 2 times 1 times 1 minus 1, which is 0. So again, the derivative is 0. So, the derivative, well, so the function is another constant. This time the constant is 1. So again, the population doesn't change. What if what if instead of that I tell you that the population in 2005 is a half? 
What do I know? I won't know the population in 2009 without a lot more work, but uh, well, let's not make it be a half. Let's make it be a tenth, just to. Well, so what do I know about P of 2009? I'm sorry? It's one tenth. It's one tenth? Well, why would it be one tenth? Because it's in a constant thing? Nope, it's not a constant now because P prime. 2005 is twice a tenth times 1 minus a tenth, which is, I don't know, 9 tenths, 9 one hundredths, 18 over 100. Yeah. It's bigger than a tenth. So this is bigger than zero. And in fact, if you just look, all of the populations between 0 and 1 if the population is between 0 and 1 p prime is bigger than 0 so that means that the population will grow but that's about all we know because the p is an increasing function for values between 0 and a tenth, but that's about all we know. Let me come back to this notion. So these kinds of solutions are called equilibrium solutions. So, so if you know that your derivative You know that the derivative is sometimes zero, then the solution is a constant. And this is called an equilibrium solution. Or sometimes it's called a fixed point. So, I mean, if, if you're doing chemistry, a lot of times you have a solution. So if you have two solutions you mix and some stuff happens, and concentrations of one thing change, and then eventually the solution becomes an equilibrium. That saying that the differential equation that governs the reaction of the solutions is tending towards some steady state where the derivative is zero. The change of stuff. There's no change of stuff. Same thing in physics. We're describing the motion of something and eventually it gets to an equilibrium, it doesn't move anymore. The derivative is zero. So finding places where the derivative is zero is useful, but not the whole story. So we will focus on that a little bit. Um, but we can tell some things from that. Now, we can also do some other things without knowing a lot. So for example, if I tell you, so let's take another example. Suppose that I have a function uh, y double prime is, I don't know, minus 9y. So there's some function, and I tell you that y of x is, so what do I want here? I want 3, this one works, right? 3 times the sine of x. Uh, well, there's some constant, I'm sorry, the sine is 3x. Some constant, 
times the sine of 3x. So I'm telling you this. Now, I can just check. The derivative here is 3a cosine of 3x. And the second derivative is 9a minus sine of 3x. So yes, that is indeed a solution. Now, I didn't tell you how to figure out that it was the sine. I just said, it looks like that. But a is some constant. Now, if I give you a little more information, for example, well, since this is the sine, I know that y of 0 has to be 0. When p is 0, y of 0 has to be 0. But I can give you another piece of information. So if I tell you also, so I could ask, so for what values of a, is it true that when time is 0, I have 0, but also when time is 0, the derivative is 1? This is called an initial condition. If I have, I guess I shouldn't abbreviate it, I'll write the word condition. So since this is a second order equation, there are actually two initial conditions uh, that will fully nail down the equation, but I'm sort of telling you how it starts out. So if I don't tell you this part, so, if I, if I don't tell you this initial condition, then any function, any sine function with any amplitude satisfies the equation. Right? This is the graph of a sine 3x for three different values of a. Let's make it four different values of a. They all look like this, but I have several different ones. But when I give you an initial condition, I'm asking you to pick one of them out. If this is describing the motion of a pendulum, I guess it's oscillating here. This is describing the motion of a pendulum. I'm telling you, when I looked at it, the pendulum was hanging straight down, but it was moving with velocity 1. Right? This is the velocity. This is the position. And I'm telling you up front, it's described by a times the sine of 3x by some magic formula. But now I want to describe it completely. I want to pick out a solution. So what do I do? I told you this information. In addition to that information, how can I figure out what a is? Sorry? Just plug in the values and I get an equation for A. This is not hard stuff. I told you the class gets a lot easier. This is not hard. You just have to think about what's going on. Well, I know that Y of 0 is supposed to be 1. And that's A times the sine of 3 times 0, which is 0. So that didn't give me any information. Uh, sorry, 0. That didn't give me any information. But I also know from here that y prime of 0 is supposed to be 1. And this is 3a times the cosine of 3 times 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, so that's 3a. So that tells me a is a third. <coughs> so I know this function exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what? No. 
So let's just check that this actually works. That A equals one third works. So I have Y double prime is minus nine times y. Right? That's what I started with. I hope so. And let's check that if a is a third, it works. So that means that y of x is one third sine of three x y prime of x is 1 times the sine, sorry, times the cosine of 3x, and y double prime is 3 times the sine of 3x, but it's negative, right? But this is negative 3 times Sorry, negative 9 times 1 third of the sine of x, which is y. So we're good. And it'll work for any value of a. Because here I just said a is some number, I don't know it. Let's check that it works. Sure enough, it works. So, you know, because I chose 1, it looks a little suspicious that this 3 is not a 9. But this 3 is one third of a 9. Okay? So, given an initial condition, this will nail down, if the initial condition is appropriate, it will nail down the solution. Um, and so really, when we solve the differential equation, just like when we do an indefinite integral, there is a constant or some constants floating around that we need to figure out. So, the solution to a differential equation usually depends on some unknown constants. Usually it's one, but some. One is some. which we can figure out well okay. so that means that the solution is not one function but lots of functions so for example If I say that the derivative of y is equal to y, we know that e to the x works, but any constant times e to the x works. For any choice of k, the derivative depends on maybe my table can up So for any choice of this constant, this solves the equation. So there's not just one solution, there's a whole bunch of them for various values of k. And in fact, yeah. so there's a whole bunch of them that depend on k. And we can nail down which one if we have initial conditions. Is there a question? No? Okay. We 
can pick out which one depending on initial conditions. And so, just like when you learn to do integrals, there's this plus C that a lot of people forget, and then they lose a point because they forget the plus C, and blah, blah, blah. But it's important because the integral of a function is not a function. It's a whole bunch of functions. And the C tells you which specific one. So the constant of integration, and this is the same as the constant of integration. In fact, the verb that you use to solve the differential equation is sometimes you can use the verb that you're integrating the differential equation, even if you're not just writing down an integral. And the word integrate has Another meaning in English, it doesn't just mean to find an antiderivative, it means to take disparate things and put them together. And that's what we're doing when we solve the differential equation, and I want to sort of elaborate on that a little bit. So suppose we have no knowledge of how to come up with a solution. So far, all of our solutions are just Look at it and guess and see what it is. Right? So far, all I did is I said, well, I told you. The answer is this. Does it work? Yup. Look at that. What do you think the answer might be? Make a guess. Does it work? Yup. Or no. And we go from there. And, and we'll, we will develop some techniques. But before that, you can still do some stuff to understand what the differential equation looks like what the solution looks like. So I want to go over some of that stuff, which is analogous to what I just did here, that I'm erasing. So we can understand this differential equation and what it's telling us by thinking about it. And we can think about it. Pictures are helpful sometimes in thinking about these things. So say I have a differential equation like that. And I don't know how to solve this. Well, I do know how to solve it. But I don't know how to come up with a formula. It says the growth rate of the thing is how much you have plus the time. So, it grows faster as time increases, but it also grows proportional to how much is there. And if you prefer, instead of using x, I can use t. It doesn't matter. So this differential equation, how can we possibly understand what this does without solving? So we can make a picture where I put x's here, I put y's here, and I'm not going to graph the solution. Instead, I'm going to graph the slope. So I can make a direction field, or a vector field, or a vector field. which tells me something about the solutions. So if I think about, so what does this mean? It means so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bunch of lines on the chalkboard, which are the slopes to the solution. So for example, if I know that at x equals 0, y equals 0, What's the derivative when x equals 0 and y equals 0? 0. So right here, the derivative is 0. That one's a bad one to do because it's a little hard to see. But let's say if x equals 1, 
and y equals 0, then the slope is plus 1. So at 1, 0, the slope is 1. And at 2, 0, the slope is 2. And so on. And for negative values of x, when x is negative 1 and y is 0, the slope is minus 1. And when x is minus 2 and y is 0, the slope is minus 2. And so on. Now let's move up a little bit. When y is 1 and x is 0, the slope here is 1. And when y is 2 and x is 0, the slope here is 2. And so on. This is a very tedious process, but we can go through and sort of draw a bunch of lines that tell us something about how the solutions behave. This is kind of not a very good picture. So we'll turn this on before. Um, instead of doing this by hand, well, I'll just talk about it while it warms up. Um, so I already know some stuff about the solution. What do I know about the solution? What do they go like if I start here? Will the solution decrease in, as x increases, does the y value go up or down? I heard wall wall, I heard down, I heard up. So does, how many people think the solution stays constant? No. How many people think the solution will decrease? How many people think the solution will increase? A couple. How many people have no clue what the hell's going on here? <laughs> One honest person. Two. Okay. So soon. Do I have a picture here? Uh, it says I don't believe you.
If I go one tenth in x, what will be the y value? About. It'll still be minus one. But why is it minus one? It's minus one because the derivative is zero at x zero. And this is my step size h. Then I do it again. So now I have two things. My next x, well, I'm just going to go up by another tenth. So at point two, my y value will be my old y value. So I'm just, I'm here, and I said, go this way for a tenth. So the arrow tells me not to do anything, but just go this way. So I land there at one tenth. But now there's a little arrow pointing slightly down. So I'm going to take where I was before, and I'm going to add on what the derivative tells me to do at the new place. So in this case, this is minus 1 plus 1 tenth. That's, I picked a very messy one. I should have done an easier one. So this is minus 1 plus 1 tenth. And the derivative here at 1 tenth is not 0. It is What's my function? One tenth, that's x, times the sine of minus of a tenth times minus one. So this is a horrible number. This was a bad example. This is one one hundredth. The sine of minus a tenth is slightly less than zero. And I continue in this way. It doesn't seem to change much for a little while, but then suddenly it will get very steep down. When I get over here, it will get very steep down. So let me write this again in a more formula way, and then maybe go through an easier example. This example is nasty to do by hand, but it makes a nice picture. Let's do the x plus y one, which is easy to do by hand and makes a boring picture. So let me write Euler's method again. So uh, let me point out also there's a new web sign up, what? Which is due uh, on the Wednesday that we don't have class, just before Thanksgiving, so that you won't be bored while you're getting ready to go for Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, so, okay. So Euler's method says the following. So I start, I pick a step size. Which I'm calling H. It's always called H for some reason. Um, which is usually a small number. And then my initial condition. So I have an initial condition. Uh, are my initial condition, and I just let that be my initial condition. And then I set x1 to be the previous x plus h, and my y1 is, so I have a differential equation here, y prime equals f of xy. So y1 is going to be the previous y, plus h times whatever I get when I plug the previous x and the previous y into the differential equation. That gives me an x1 and a y1. Then I repeat. x2 is x1 plus h. y2 
y1 plus whatever the slope is. And I just keep going. So I do this for a long time. In general, x n plus 1, the next x, is the previous x plus h. And y n plus 1 is the previous y plus h times the function at the previous time. So this example that I did was horrible, so let's do an easier example like x plus y. Um, I think I have time. No, I don't have time? No? Okay, so let me point out that if I don't make any progress, you won't be able to do the homework. <laughs> which is already picked. But, so let's do it very quickly. Let's we'll spend one minute. So I have the differential equation y prime equals x plus y with the initial condition, uh, let's say y of 0 equals, uh, let's not start at 1. Yeah, let's start with y of 0 equals negative 1. Okay, and let's take the steps I should to make things easy. Let's take h equals a half. So that means that x0 is 0, y0 is negative 1, x1 is 0 plus a half, y0 is negative 1 plus a half of x plus y here. So negative 1 equals negative is negative 3 halves. x2 is 1 because it's a half plus a half. Oops, that's a 1. y2 is y1 plus a half of x0 plus y0, or x1 plus y1, which is minus 3 halves plus a half, and then here I have minus three halves plus one half is minus one, which is minus four halves, which is minus two. X three is three halves, which is one plus a half. Y three is the previous Y here, which is minus two plus a half of the previous x, which is minus, oh I picked a really stupid value, oh well, which is minus two and a half, is minus five half. Two, five halves. Two, yeah, and so on, so we just continue. Now this one is really stupid because I actually happen to choose something that lives on a line. Uh, I should have picked a different initial condition. So the one that I'm constructing here is this one. It doesn't do anything interesting. I should have started at zero, 0, But I did. Okay, I'll do more of this next time, and then we'll talk about actually writing down formulas.